Ja, hello and good afternoon and a warm welcome to the next webinar of the Ryanex Biomedical here in Lennestadt, uh, directly from the Sauerland Pyramids. Yes, a warm welcome also from my side. And really, it's a pleasure for me that we can today present you a webinar related to long COVID disease. As you know, it's a pleasure for us to support you with coronavirus infection before, after, what to do and how to support with the bioresonance according to Paul Schmidt. And today, really, we thought we need more experts. You know, both of us, we have a lot of experiences in bioresonance according to Paul Schmidt. But I think long COVID is so, so um, important and it's really in uh, all over the world very present that we need the support from experts. We have on the one side Kerstin Peuschel. She's a senior physician in the Paul Schmidt Clinic. She's leading the Paul Schmidt Clinic and very experienced with patients related to long COVID. And on the other side, Gina Alberts. Gina Alberts wrote her master thesis in uh, micronutrient therapy and regulatory medicine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Before we um, starting with uh, the webinar, I think it is important um, to have a short information about the legal notice. And therefore, please note that the many tips and advice uh, given in this webinar cannot replace a visit to the naturopath or naturopath uh, doctor. Furthermore, please note that conventional medicine has neither accepted or acknowledged the effect of bioenergetic vibration. You know that we have already um, a clinical prospective double-blind randomized uh, study. But of course, ha with having this, it is not automatically that uh, with this uh, gold standard study, um, the conventional medicine uh, accepts um, uh, bioresonance or bioenergetic vibrations. I think this is very important to know. Yeah, another, uh, I think, very important information for you is that you can review uh, the webinar uh, because we are uh, presenting this webinar a little bit later, I think in the next days, also on the YouTube channel and um, also uh, on the Ryanex uh, wiki. That's the actual plan. Um, YouTube is, of course, very easy uh, to visit. You know, in your browser, you can uh, choose uh, YouTube. Then uh, you have uh, to enter Ryanex in the, uh, in the search line. Um, pressing then on the playlists and, uh, of course, international, and then you can click uh, the webinar. This is, uh, I think, really very easy. In case that you have problems with that, uh, contact uh, your uh, international partner. Uh, I think uh, we will uh, work on that to give you the access to this uh, webinar. Yeah, then uh, let's start with the webinar of Long Covid. Yes, before we start with our experts, I want to give you uh, a little bit numbers to have an idea what we are talking about. Meanwhile, we have uh, 26, uh, 26 million German people um, who were infected with coronavirus. Um, I cannot imagine how big is the number worldwide, but you can imagine in every country we have big, big problems. And the one thing is that they are infected, but it's not the same like in other diseases. You have an infect before, after, and then everything is fine. No. Meanwhile, I found out in the number in Germany is 10% of all these persons, once who are infected, have still problems, still long-term effects from coronavirus infection. And uh, yes, when we talk uh, about uh, coronavirus and about long COVID, it's very interesting about the symptoms because we have a lot of symptoms. And it's not easy that we really can say, OK, because of these symptoms, you have long COVID problem or is it another problem? And to divide is a big, big problem because we are talking about fatigue, for example, persistent tiredness shortness of breath. I think many people have the problem really in the upper respiratory system, but also muscle and joint pains can uh, there be other symptom. Concentration disorders, I think everybody knows foggy brain. Foggy brain is uh, very, uh, yes, everybody knows what it means. Mm. We have also sleep disorders, many, many problems. And therefore, to divide 
Is it a problem of long COVID or is it related, for example, to other viruses or something else? Therefore, we need more information from our experts. Yeah, and uh, one of these experts is definitely um, Mrs. Uh, Peuschel. Uh, she is uh, the, um, the leader of the Paul Schmidt uh, Clinic in Bad Heiligenstadt. And uh, she will now explain to us um, um, her uh, view on uh, long COVID and also, uh, of course, um, uh, practical excurses um, and case reports about uh, um, treatments uh, regarding long COVID patients. Yes, And uh, we are really very happy uh, to... Uh, invite now um, Mrs. Peuschel to this webinar. We recorded this webinar before uh, so that uh, we can translate it uh, um, in the, the English language um, to you so that you can follow it easily. Therefore, um, uh, we present now Mrs. Peuschel and uh, yeah, hopefully everybody uh, will get uh, uh, helpful and uh, yeah, helpful information regarding long COVID. Yes, thank you very much for the introductory words. I'm very happy to have been invited here to talk about long COVID. As you have already heard, I basically come from regular conventional medicine. As far as my training is concerned, I'm a surgeon, a, a thoracic surgeon, and I've been working with bioresonance since 2002 and since 2016 in the clinic mentioned below. Long COVID is an important topic. For one to one and a half years, these symptoms have been observed and attempted to be treated. At the outset, I would like to say that you have to be careful. I would like to appeal to all therapists that one should not immediately assume the long COVID syndrome or post COVID syndrome, even if the symptoms fit but that one should actually rather uh, look to determine whether there could be other illnesses causing these symptoms. Often things are overlooked nowadays because everything is thrown into the COVID basket. So it is very important to me that serious diseases or other diseases are not overlooked. Long COVID syndrome or post COVID syndrome is a very serious disease that has many aspects. I will try to outline this and then illustrate it with four practical examples. Sometimes there is a confusion in the definition, often also in the literature. I wanted to have a chronological sequence, a timeline, and for this purpose I followed the definition of the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence which defined a chronological sequence. It is considered that the acute phase of a COVID disease lasts up to four weeks. Most patients report symptoms of illness between five and 10 days. However, there are prolonged causes of up to four weeks. This is not yet a long COVID or post COVID, but is still within the scope of a normal COVID disease. The long COVID is defined by this organization, the period uh, between four to 12 weeks after the, the disease and everything that comes after that. So that is described as post COVID syndrome. What is it? These are symptoms of the infection that are ongoing. It can be headaches, sinusitis, concentration problems, joint inflammation, all the symptoms you might have during the acute phase. But they can also be completely new symptoms that cannot be explained by other illnesses. They can be permanent or recurrent. Um, this means that the patient does not necessarily have to experience these symptoms every day. They may be present and then absent and may vary in severity. The Robert Koch Institute and the German Association of the Scientific uh, Medical Societies go even further and say we can also classify the following as post-COVID syndrome. The worsening of underlying diseases that in principle have no clinical correlate or where I can find no reason why an underlying disease has now worsened so much in a patient. In particular, of course, autoimmune diseases, for example, rheumatism or MS, 
and things like that. If you say, okay, this is not a normal relapse, but I don't know where it comes from, then you could consider it as part of this post-COVID or long-COVID disease. What symptoms are we talking about? First of all, of course, chronic fatigue. Unfortunately, that's also a term where all sorts of things fall into. But of course, it is also clear that if we have a general fatigue in the cell turnover and in the energy of cells, then there are symptoms of fatigue in the entire system. That is why it is important to write down the patient's complaints in the medical history and also to state exactly how severe they are, what their manifestations are, so that we can actually do a follow-up and see how the patient develops in the course of the treatment. Neurological symptoms are quite common after COVID, loss of sense, of smell and taste, for example, but also concentration disorders, dizziness and nerve disorders. Here again, the appeal, please, if the patient comes with new neurological symptoms, please also make a normal diagnosis to exclude that the patient has another disease pattern, which only incidentally falls together with the COVID disease. Mental disorders are also very common after COVID infections, especially anxiety disorders and depression are relatively common. Later, we will look at the patient examples and we will see why this is the case. Also, psychosomatic disorders. On the one hand, they are caused by the patient now being very sensitized and listening very much to his body, but also due to the development of chronic pain syndrome caused by the imbalance of neurotransmitters. Of course, organ symptoms can also persist mainly in the target organs of a coronavirus, such as lungs, heart, but also the muscular skeletal system, the gastrointestinal tract, ear, nose and throat, and skin. Overall, it is said that post or long COVID syndrome results in a restriction of the functional ability in everyday life. The patient considers his or her overall quality of life to be impaired or even has a permanent disability due to the disease. For example, a loss of the sense of smell and taste. What I found important and interesting is that the 180-day mortality rate after the COVID disease is 30% in patients with a moderate to severe cause of the disease. For example, patients who develop pneumonia or the like. That is very, very high. And you can see that such an infection can cause significant organ damage. The data collection of symptoms in long and post-COVID syndrome is, of course, subject to errors. This is because at the beginning it was not known that such prolonged causes of the disease existed. And, of course, one did not know what should be recorded in the first place. First of all, everything that could be recorded was recorded, and that was the right thing to do. But of course, there are also um, duplications. It has not yet been done within the framework of a structured study. But still, I think you can take these registered symptoms or findings to identify a trend. In the UK, 20% of COVID patients described a long COVID syndrome and a relatively high proportion of them, one third, developed a fatigue syndrome. Then, a meta-analysis was made of European data from all European countries with 50,000 patients. There you can see much higher numbers of long and post-COVID patients. Much of the data comes from Northern Europe, but also from Italy. And we see that fatigue symptoms in more than half of the cases um, are present, headaches in 44% and concentration disorders in 27%. So a large proportion of neurological disorders like uh, smell disorders are present and these kinds of disorders outweigh the local organ symptoms, for example, 24% shortness of breath. 
I found that very interesting. There was a study published in The Lancet from China. They made an assessment six months after COVID to see what was still left of it. And uh, they actually described an incidence of 76% of COVID patients who still have symptoms six months later. In particular, fatigue, muscle weakness, and mental syndromes. Ireland also reported 60% post-COVID disorders and again, in particular, in particular, fatigue, and also shortness of breath and discomfort. But also in southern countries, Bangladesh, with 50% of post-COVID patients here too, with mainly fatigue. Of course, these causes are more frequent in cases of more severe illnesses, but patients either had a very severe cause in hospital or a moderately severe cause with long-lasting symptoms and pneumonia and so on. What is known? What does the virus do? It causes organ damage through inflammation. It's a virus whose main target uh, organ is the lungs and also the respiratory tract, the sinuses, but also the heart muscle. The viral infection causes inflammation and then scarring, for example, in the lungs with pulmonary fibrosis after severe causes of COVID although this is sometimes also triggered by therapy. Auto antibodies are found in 50% of hospitalized COVID patients. A study was conducted to determine how people who were hospitalized evolved. And after three to six months, auto antibodies were detected in the blood. These cause further disorders such as uh, joint inflammation, for example, urticaria, blood formation disorders, which can be explained simply by the fact that the body forms antibodies against the body's own tissues triggered by COVID infection. Also, microthrombi in the organs cause functional disorders in the organs depending on the extent and intensity of the disorders, which then lead to a wide variety of organ disorders. And what I also find important is the viral activation of previously inactive viruses. There are many viruses that survive in the body after initial infection. Of course, the herpes zoster virus in the nerve endings or the cytomegalovirus, the EBV virus in the lymph organs, um, which are well known. In these cases, infections are relatively often activated, and this can also be serologically detected very easily. In particular, in the case of EBV, every time new lab values are determined, it can be serologically seen very clearly clearly that a zero conversion has taken place. What are the risk factors for the development of a long or post-COVID syndrome? Of course, we already said that the severity of uh, the COVID illness. In patients who have um, only mild flu-like symptoms, this is not quite as uh, common or frequent as in patients who have had to be admitted to a hospital. It is also important to have more than five symptoms in the first week of illness. They come together relatively quickly. Cough, cold, hoarseness, joint and muscle complaints, headaches, that's already five. And then there is fever. So patients have at least five symptoms relatively often. Then, pre-existing lung diseases, of course, I've only listed uh, bronchial asthma here, but of course a pre-existing pulmonary fibrosis or silicosis or COPD are also important risk factors. Also, multi-allergies, because in these cases the immune system is already imbalanced and then the virus disrupts the immune system even further. This can lead to the formation of the aforementioned autoantibodies or to a worsening of the allergy situation. Normal medication that patients often take may no longer have any effect at all. And of course, high viral loads, but this usually correlates with the cause or the progress of the disease. 
severe causes of the disease uh, usually have a higher viral load. Then autoantibodies are already present. We have patients who already had them before, for example, in the case of lupus, antibodies, or the like. And of course, they also have a higher risk to, of developing post or long COVID syndrome. Of course, previous infections with persistent viruses, the prevalence of EBV and viruses of the herpes group is very high in the population, so that there can be outbreaks again and again. Here it is worth having a lab check to say, okay, how is my EBV and uh, diabetes mellitus uh, and being female are also risk factors. You could uh, also include blood group A in brackets, which has a somewhat high risk of infection or spread of COVID-19. I've brought four patients, uh, patient, patient examples to illustrate that some of the patients are uh, patients that have already completed therapy and some are still in therapy. My first example is a 36-year-old patient who is a full-time teacher. She teaches sports and German at a regular school, is married and has two children. Her previous conditions include pollen allergy and also allergy to metals, food and dyes. That means a relatively wide range of allergies. Besides, there was nothing special about the patient's uh, previous condition. Well, the fact that she's a woman might also be a risk factor here. She was ill with COVID in January 2021 for a total of three weeks. She was treated at home, but she had a variety of symptoms. Initially, she had shortness of breath. Later, she actually developed COVID pneumonia, rhinitis, loss of smell and taste, also muscle and limb pain, joint pain, especially of the knee joints and also the ankle joints. She had subfebrile temperatures and intermittent headaches for almost the entire three weeks. So as we can see here, she had more than five symptoms. The patient came to us for the first time in March 2022, and she reported post-COVID syndromes, especially fatigue, and that she was constantly exhausted and tired. After the tiniest effort, she was really exhausted. Because she works full-time as a teacher and has a household and children to look after, it has, uh, of course, been particularly difficult for the patient to manage everything and uh, to continue with her normal life. The headache was present every day in waves in different places, sometimes like a headache storm, sometimes more like a pressure, like a band around the head, sometimes starting from the back of the head. And she observed that her mental state decompensated very, very quickly. That means that she could hardly tolerate, tolerate the stress at work, at school, or also at home with her two small children. During sports, she's a sports teacher. She reported shortness of breath even when walking up the stairs. And the sacroiliitis was very disturbing for her. It persisted and was sometimes worse, sometimes better. What did we find in the RAH scan? In the nutrient analysis, very clear changes in, changes in iron. This is, of course, explainable. We need iron for our immune system. It basically guides our oxidation and reduction reactions in the body, in the metabolism. We know that iron deficiency leads directly to a degeneration of the T lymphocyte system. And we know that there are also blood formation disorders, especially in the formation of erythrocyte precursors. It leads to the infectious anemia, which is very well known. What is important mentioning here, uh, this was not the case with this patient, but nevertheless, it is very important that you check the iron levels and in case of doubt, do not give iron in an uncontrolled way. Because in case of very massive viral infections, also in case of tumor diseases or serious bacterial infections, iron levels can actually be high 
in a normal rate or too abnormally high because of the iron retention in the macrophage, which is partly triggered by the virus. And if you then uh, supplement it with iron, you worsen the situation, you know that uh, this iron overload in the body in the course of an infection is always um, something that has a bad prognosis. So please be careful and determine the iron level first. Zinc is also important for T cell proliferation for the immune system in the area of the T lymphocytes. B vitamins are important for the entire metabolism. Yeah, disorders of the enzymes listed here, um, Q10, cytochrome C reductase, cytochrome P450, and also tryptophan and hydroxylase. So here we have a clear reduction of the enzymes of the respiratory chain, which means that energy production is very much restricted. And what I said before, the mental syndromes are symptoms in post-COVID can often be explained by these disorders of the uh, tryptophan uh, serotonin uh, synthesis um, and also amino acids uh, and phenylalanine and uh, tryptophan are disturbed here, which again is an indication of the neurological, psycho psychological or mental stress of the patient. And of course, leucine, which is important for cell healing, in particular of the nerve cells. Here too, we see a, a clear deficit in the patient. Uh, activated viruses are CMV, EBV, HPV and H5N1, which are detectable serologically and can also be confirmed in the zero conversion. ATP reduction, especially in the target organs, lung, spleen, liver, and bone marrow, and infectious anemia. And in the organic system, there's, of course, impairment of the hematopoiesis, cytokine storm, allergy exacerbation, atypical pneumonia, asthma, a burden of the right heart, arthritis, especially in the extremities, the lower extremities, and in the area of the lumbar spine. Also clear impairments of the autonomic or vegetative nervous system and the cranial nerves, but also disorders in detoxification and also visible psychological changes in the skin. What did we do? We gave the patients bioresonance therapy twice a week. She came to the practice for this. We used the scan to supplement the nutrients and amino, amino acids in a targeted way. The patient received an infusion therapy with a focus on cell respiration, on the lungs, of course, and the immune system, and re the reduction of inflammation. And because of the disrupted cell respiration and energy production, we decided to do an intermittent hypoxia, hyperoxia therapy. In principle, this is a targeted mitochondrial training where the patient is exposed to hypoxia for a defined period of time and is then given hyperoxia in the next phase. This then changes about 10, 20 times during the course of the therapy. The aim is to train and activate the mitochondria and uh, cellular respiration again. In particular, to have an effect on the Q10 and the P450. The patient also received a no sewed therapy in relation to her EBV infection because of the very high values seen in the lab. The end of treatment was in May 2022, and the patient has completely recovered from long COVID and post-COVID. The second patient example is also a female patient who is an office worker, lives in a shared household, and has no children. Like in the previous case, again, we have various allergies to certain foods and preservatives. The patient had a COVID disease in May 2021, but with a relatively mild course. She said, I had very mild symptoms for about five days with a cold, a bit of a cough, a bit of a scratchy throat, and then it was all over. 
all in all, I felt a bit bad for about two weeks. Uh, I just slowed down a bit, but um, in the end, I overcome it quite. I uh, overcame it quite well with mild flu-like symptoms. In September, the patient was symptom-free. Then she developed sudden heat and cold urticaria without any reason. This means that every time there was a change in temperature, whether it was a shower, a change from one room to another, or a change between indoors and outdoors, the patient developed urticarial symptoms or blisters all over her body. She then went to her GP. She, uh, well, the GP did a blood count, found anemia, and a significant uh, drop in platelets which um, actually required normal conventional medical treatment. She had an enlarged liver and spleen on ultrasound and complained of arthritic symptoms in the joints of her hands and fingers. The patient then reported flickering vision. At first, she couldn't associate this, but then she said, yes, actually, this had been going on since September. Uh, I also had increased dizziness and thought it might be due to my blood pressure, but blood pressure was actually okay. She said I had dizziness, disorientation, sometimes I didn't really know where I was. So this patient did indeed have autoantibodies in her blood. The patient had uh, then came to us in November 2021. In the scan, we saw the activation of EBV and, of course, organ-specific aspects like bone marrow, for example. This is logical given the hematopoietic disorder and the platelet drop. Also, allergy activation, alteration of the immune system, and also vegetative and other stress could be seen in the patient. When it comes to organ-specific aspects, joints, CNS, liver, kidney, and a distinct detoxification disorder. The mapping of the symptoms to the organs in the RH, RAH scan was interesting, in particular bone marrow, but also uh, hematopoiesis and allergy, which I found very interesting in connection with the newly appeared urticaria and autoantibodies. The patient received bioresonance therapy at our clinic and came to see us every 10 days, where we checked her values again and tested her again. She then had a PS10 for home, which she used at night. Here in the practice, she got an infusion therapy focusing on the immune system, on allergies, uh, on the liver and kidneys. In addition, she was given iron after we had checked the lab results. She also received a nosote therapy with EBV nosote. The end of therapy was March 2022. Here too, the urticaria symptoms and other symptoms have not reappeared. Our patient, example three, is a male patient, 52 years old and a freelance artist. He's married and has one child. There is a previous autoimmune disease in the broadest sense, which is um, ulcerative colitis. The patient also has a metabolic syndrome despite his relatively young age and bronchial asthma since childhood. This patient had a COVID disease in December 2020 with a very, very severe cause, started right away with shortness of breath and cough. Three days after symptom onset, he already had to be on ventilation and later had ECMO therapy, followed by multi-organ failure. The patient was in the intensive care unit of the hospital until April 2021. The patient then came to us in May 2021. His symptoms were the following. Severe fatigue. He could only concentrate for a short time, like 10 to 15 minutes, after which he virtually fell asleep at the table. He had very, very severe shortness of breath, even with the slightest effort. 
when walking uh, in a straight line, he had a big challenge. Um, he had various edema, especially in the extremities, but also ascites, also muscle and joint disorders. He reported severe pain daily, especially in the legs. So what did we find in the scan? We found energy deficiency in all vital organs, which is, of course, also an expression of this extreme fatigue, um, as well as, of course, disorders in the immune system, liver, kidney, lungs, detoxification. On the one hand, this is to be expected after multi-organ failure. But it also clearly shows the inflammatory changes that the viral disease causes in the organ systems. What did we do with the patient? We started to treat him every three days here in the clinic. During the therapy here, he received an infusion therapy each time, focusing on the immune system and, uh, of course, also on de detoxification, on liver, kidney and heart. In addition, he also received oxygen therapy, according to Professor von Arden, and intermittent hypoxia and hyperoxia therapy to simply reactivate the respiratory chain to train the mitochondria again and to simply provide the patient with more energy. In addition, this patient also, also received a homeopathic co-treatment. The therapy is in the process of being phased out. We see that the therapy started almost a year ago. There has been a clear improvement. The patient is able to function in a normal life again. He can walk normal distances. He can do his job again. Of course, he still suffers from these muscle and joint problems from time to time. And he's not as resilient as he used to be. That is very clear. And that is why he's still in therapy. But this shows that you sometimes need a lot of patients to actually treat this post-COVID syndrome. The patient's proneness to edema has completely disappeared, which is very nice. So he's doing much better overall, but we'll need a little more time here. Our fourth patient example, a female patient, 46 years old, occupational therapist, single, one child. She has a pre-existing condition of hypertension, which is also treated with medication and an allergy to pollen and food. She was ill with COVID in December 2021. The symptoms were like in a flu-like infection, she said. She had little shortness of breath, then basically had a normal cold, a cough, hoarseness, fever, headache and pain in the limbs. Duration of the symptoms about three weeks. She first came to us in May 22 and reported extreme blood pressure fluctuations, which she did not have before. And previously with normal general medication, she used to manage it very well. And now she says, I can't control my blood pressure anymore. It's sometimes high, then low. I don't know how to manage this with my pills. I can't handle it anymore. She also reports vision problems, dizziness and a general lack of energy. What did we see in the scan? Amino acid deficiencies of leucine, and again, problems with nerve cell healing and cell healing in general, also related to metabolism and a very, very high viral load. A high number of reactivated viruses. On the one hand, we see the energy footprint of corona viruses. Uh, various flu viruses as well, RSV, Coxsackie viruses, CMV, herpes viruses. In other words, a wide range of neuro and lymphotropic viruses that have been activated here. Hormone disorder concerning dopamine, nutrient deficiencies, calcium and selenium, and then of course, organic disorders in the region of the brain. Of course, the patient also reports many neuro neurological symptoms, also in the area of the vestibulocochlear nerve. 
which could also explain the symptoms of dizziness and orientation disorders. And of course, we see the stress activation here too. What did we to do with the patient? She received bioresonance therapy once a week. We substituted the appropriate nutrients and amino acids, and she received a specific infusion therapy for the nervous system, for inflammation, and for the blood vessels. With this patient, we added biofeedback vascular training. This means that she basically sat in front of a screen and uh, via biofeedback, she learned how to relax and dilate the vessels. Basically, a measurement is uh, made um, in the area of the arteria temporalis using plethysmography. Um, that measures the flow through the vessels, and the patient then has a direct feedback on the screen. The screen shows a standardized vessel that visualizes how the width of the vessel is, vessel is changing, and by means of uh, vegetative influencing and a corresponding vegetative training, he, the patient can induce a vascular dilatation, um, which is a state of relaxation. Then uh, the patient also uh, initiated an oxygen therapy. Anyway, we have only recently started the treatment for this patient. That means that she's still undergoing treatment. The symptoms are improving, and I expect the treatment to be completed in the next month if it continues to progress in this positive way. Yes, I hope that with this little practical exercise, I was able to show how long and post-COVID symptoms affect a patient. Also, how the patients should be managed in principle, uh, what kind of disorders can be found if you look more closely, and you also examine the RAH scan. And, um, in fact, the very good news is that there are ways to influence this long and post-COVID syndrome, but sometimes it takes a bit of patience, a bit of persistence, until you manage that these patients who have very severe diseases can improve. But I think one can and should definitely do something about it because the patients really need help. It is very difficult for them to get out of the situation on their own. So thank you very much for your attention. Please feel free to ask questions via the clinic's website and thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Mrs. Uh, Peuschel, uh, to all this, uh, I think, very helpful information regarding long COVID and especially uh, the case reports are uh, very impressive from my point of view. Yeah. Yeah. Therefore, now uh, we are going uh, over to the next step. Yes, it's a pleasure for me to offer you uh, one more opportunity, for example, for an active support for yourself. Because uh, when we talk about nutrition, about minerals, vitamins, you know that it's very important to have this in the body. But now in this situation with long COVID, we need more. We need more support and sometimes it's not enough and only to take care for good food or gen organic food or something else. No, because um, it's so strong. Uh, what happens um, when you have uh, these uh, long COVID symptoms? You have to support it in a better way. And um, for me, really, it's a pleasure for me to give you uh, an expert to your side. And I told you in the start that we have uh, Gina Alberts here. And Gina Alberts, she wrote her master thesis and she really will give you a good support and explanation to minerals, vitamins, how, when, why to take and to eat. <laughs> Therefore, it's really a pleasure to have her lecture today. Good evening from my side as well. Today I'm here at the webinar in a different role. Most of you might know me from the veterinary division of Ryanex company, but as I just explained, I've been doing my master's degree in nutritional science at the site of my job 
and I've been doing a lot of work on the subject. And of course, during the COVID period, I've also been looking into what we can ultimately do to get through this time and to support people who have already had an infection. And we have already heard a lot from Mrs. Bunkenburg, for example, about all the symptoms that can occur after COVID infection. And I would like to give a small and brief insight into how important it is to look into our bulk elements and trace elements, but also into our vitamins and amino acids. And of course, I can only cover a small part of it. First of all, I want, I want to try to give an overview about what is important and about what the levels I might have to have tested in order to see whether uh, my levels are okay. On the first slide, we have zinc, copper, manganese, and selenium. These are the ones I've chosen and which could be important in the case of a long COVID problem. Regarding long COVID, there has been a study from the University of Mainz that showed that 40% of people who were infected with COVID uh, showed long COVID symptoms afterwards. Symptoms that last at least six months, because that's when you would speak about long COVID. Before we take a closer look at the bulk and trace elements, I think it is also important to understand what actually happens in such an infection. You can imagine it as follows. The body comes into contact with the virus, which causes strong stress. The sympathetic nervous system is activated. So on the one hand, we have the parasympathetic sympathetic nervous system, which stands for relaxation, and the sympathetic nervous system, which activates our escape mode, so to speak. And when this is permanently activated, the formation of so-called nitrogen radicals increases. With regard uh, to COVID, uh, we should mention a peroxide nitrite, which I will come back uh, to in a moment in relation to vitamin B12. So we have the sympathetic nervous system that is firing constantly, and this leads to the formation of many radicals, and our body has to fight against them. Uh, because these radicals, these nitrogen compounds that I just mentioned, can't cause blockages in the respiratory chain of our mitochondria. Um, those are our energy plants, our little power plants in the cells. It blocks the creation of energy at the cellular level, and ultimately we have an energy deficiency that leads to the body being unable to defend itself at some point. And that is why it is so important that we look at these cofactors of our respiratory chain and the C-trade cycle. That is everything that give us, gives us energy. What are the cofactors? What can I do to support my body in the best possible way to counteract these radicals and thus counteract the lack of energy? Cofactors for the uh, citrate cycle in the respiratory chain are, for example, all B vitamins, B12, which I will address again in a moment, uh, which has a special significance. Then we have uh, magnesium, iron, copper, and manganese, zinc, Q10. Uh, carnitine and some other amino acids. So that's quite a long list. And we can look at how the levels are for each individual, which is why doing a lab uh, diagnostic makes sense in any case. Now we're finally getting to the slide, but I really had to talk about why you use the bulk and trace elements. Zinc is extremely important for our body. It is involved in over 300 enzyme and coenzyme processes, so it is everywhere. Um, with regard to COVID, it inhibits uh, the virus from entering the cell in the first place. So it inhibits its entry into our body cells. At the same time, it promotes the T-cell defense and our natural killer cells. These are the cells that work um, against the virus. So it works in two different ways. And of course, what is additionally very useful with corona or with COVID is that it inhibits inflammation, meaning it inhibits uh, the release of various mediators that trigger inflammation. That's how you can visualize it. And what is very, very important, we also have the uh, superoxide dismutase. Um, it is an ex enzyme that is responsible for the degradation of radicals. I've already said that the activation of the sympathetic nervous system 
system leads to the production of more radicals, which are produced um, physiologically by various enzyme processes in the body in a normal way. But when we have a lot of them, we have a overload and the enzymes uh, such as uh, the SOD, the superoxide dismutase, uh, are then increasingly depleted or consumed because we have more waste, so to speak, and we have to support the SOD. Uh, it is zinc dependent, that means that if I have too little zinc, it can function less. So it's biochemically involved in various processes. The same applies to copper. Copper is also involved in the SOD, and we always have to make sure that we have enough. Copper deficiency is not so well known. Many people know about iron deficiency, but not many people know that copper and iron are very closely related. There are typical symptoms of copper deficiency that you can look out for yourself, for example, uh, a copper deficiency can cause fatigue, general muscle weakness, hair loss, which is also something a lot of people report after a COVID infection, because copper is generally responsible for the repair of the organism. And if we have too little of it, or for example, a lot is consumed because I have a lot of inflammation and I need to make repairs in my body, then I have an increased consumption and need more copper or need to take more copper. Then we have manganese. Manganese is not necessarily something everyone talks about in uh, horse medicine, in equine medicine, rather than in human medicine. Manganese also has a strong uh, antioxidant effect, which means that it also reduces radicals as the SOD, it's also dependent on manganese. So this enzyme is dependent on zinc, on copper, and on manganese. And especially the manganese-dependent SOD is very present in the liver, the heart, and the ovaries. So if you have problems in those areas, it may hint to an issue with manganese. So you have to study it biochemically, putting it all in relation to each other in order to have an idea of what you need. So, of course, all of this can also be measured. Uh, now we come to the trace element that I think is being discussed a lot, which is selenium. Here again, I can say in horse medicine, it is also a trace element that is very much discussed. So not only in the human field, what is known is that selenium is very strongly involved in the development and um, also is a component of glutathione peroxidase. That sounds like a complicated th term, uh, but glutathione peroxidase is another enzyme that makes sure that radicals in our body are degraded. That's very important. In the body, we mainly have the biological form, the seleno cysteine. Please remember the latter part of the term. So cysteine, uh, we will look at this again in a moment uh, when we look into the amino acids. Uh, and this seleno uh, cysteine is a coenzyme of uh, the uh, glutathione peroxidase. And uh, glutathione peroxidase uh, depends on selenium and iron um, to function optimally and protects the body from oxidation and oxidative stress, so which I think is extremely important and uh, helps the body to regenerate vitamin C, vitamin E. Uh, vitamins are also very strong antioxidants, our waste disposal vehicle, our rubbish truck in the body, so to speak. And when the rubbish truck is full, um, to use a metaphor, we also need someone to empty it. And glutathione peroxidase is able to regenerate the whole thing. Um, Selenium also helps to inhibit cytokine release slightly. In the case of COVID, there is a very strong cytokine rush, and uh, selenium can help to inhibit this a little bit. So it's also a very important trace element. However, it has to be measured in the laboratory in any case because it can become toxic very quickly if overdosed. Well, we have finished the first slide. Now let's look at the vitamins. I believe that most of you who have already dealt with COVID, including long COVID, are familiar with uh, vitamin D. 
Vitamin D has many functions. For example, it has quite a lot of functional receptors on the various immune cells, which means that actually almost all immune cells are equipped with receptors for vitamin D. And that actually already shows how important vitamin D for the, is for the immune system in general. That means that if I have a vitamin D deficiency, which many people have, especially in the winter months, and uh, you also can see that COVID figures were high in the winter months, than in the summer months and this, that might also have something to do with the vitamin D deficiency. In general, we can say that vitamin D has an inhibitory effect on the uh, Th1 cytokines. Um, this uh, means uh, that the cytokines have a pro pro-inflammatory effect. Uh, they stimulate inflammation in the body. They are def therefore inhibited by vitamin D and the Th2 two cytokines which have a more anti-inflammatory effect are promoted. This means that uh, vitamin D brings the whole organism and the immune system back into balance between inflammatory factors and anti-inflammatory factors. That is very important. And with the long COVID symptoms, uh, there are always chronic inflammations in the background. That means that the body can no longer heal properly and vitamin D definitely plays an extremely important role here. In addition, vitamin D also promotes uh, the antimicrobial peptides. That's another very complicated word, but you can imagine it like this. These um, antimicrobial peptides make the cell membrane of the viruses unstable. So there is an instability and vitamin D has an antiviral effect in this way. So the virus is disturbed in its membrane, so to speak, and can replicate less easily. So here too, vitamin D even has a direct influence on the virus itself. Then very important again, just to mention part of it because our body is very complex, and biochemically, for example, it's very important that we have enough magnesium to convert um, vitamin D into its active form in the body. So, if certain factors are missing in this conversion process, it doesn't help to take a lot of vitamin D. You always have to consider the whole picture. So that was the topic of uh, vitamin D. And now we have vitamin C. Vitamin C is very well known. It is a very strong antioxidant, uh, so it really protects the cells from uh, radicals and is uh, reduced by glutathione. And it has even been clinically proven that vitamin C significantly reduces the vulnerability of the lower respiratory tract and the associated uh, mortality rate in severe lung infections. So vitamin C can really be great to reduce severe causes of the disease, uh, but also later on when there are still COVID symptoms uh, and I have, for example, fatigue, chronic pain, which is something that a lot of people report, it may well be that there is a vitamin C deficiency because the infection has depleted a lot and maybe it needs to be supplemented. Then we have vitamin A. Vitamin A not only helps your eyes, I think everyone thinks of that immediately, but it generally serves to protect the barrier function of our mucous membranes. So it would actually uh, make sense to have a good vitamin A level before I have an infection, but of course it also makes sense to take vitamin A afterwards when the mucous membranes are attacked. It induces the glutathione peroxidase, which means it promotes its formation. In other words, it stimulates gene expression so that it can be read, that it is more prevalent, and therefore vitamin A is also indirectly involved in the reduction of oxidative stress. So that's something you should not forget. Vitamin A is converted in the body to retinoic acid, which is an active form of the body. And uh, it has been found that retinoic acid inhibits the entry of the virus. So here too, there is an effect on the receptors. Our cells have different receptors where the virus can enter the cell. And retinoic acid acts exactly there and blocks the receptors so that the virus cannot enter the cell and infect it. 
In addition, some studies have shown that uh, vitamin A or retinoic acid can greatly reduce inflammation markers such as CRP. We can therefore use it uh, very effectively. After all, we have some inflammation, be it in the case of an acute infection or is, as in our example with long COVID, where we always have chronic inflammation. And vitamin A definitely does make sense here too. And then there is uh, vitamin B12, which is extremely important to me. I already said that our sympathetic activation produces various radicals, such as uh, peroxynitrites and um, vitamin B12 is absolutely necessary for its degradation. This means that good vitamin levels um, are extremely important, especially in older age. There are various studies that show that older people already have very low vitamin B12 levels. When it comes to nutrition, you also have to look at how you eat uh, to see if you need to add vitamin B12 on a permanent basis. In addition, oral absorption is not very good, which is why you have to use higher amounts to achieve good levels or have the doctor give you an injection or something similar. Vitamin B12 has a strong effect against uh, nitrosative stress, so which means against radicals. It is a natural antagonist and should therefore be present in sh sufficient quantities. For example, if I have too much of those nitrogen compounds uh, I just mentioned, nerves can be irritated, uh, it can have a damaging effect on blood vessels, and uh, it generally inhibits ATP production. So here again, oh, we have uh, the problem of energy deficiency, our mitochondria no longer function properly, and this is uh, also where vitamin B12 comes in. So, we have taken a look at uh, the uh, bulk and trace elements. Of course, I can only cover part of them. I've simply chosen the most important ones that need uh, to be looked at in more detail. And now, let's take a look at amino acids. First of all, we have lysine. Lysine is a strong antiviral and has an antagonism to L-arginine. Uh, um, L-arginine is the amino acid that the virus needs for replication. So that's what it likes to eat. And uh, lysine is the antagonist. This means that high lysine level uh, displaces um, L-arginine. And if we now imagine that we would deprive the virus of food, we also have an indirect effect on COVID and is therefore very helpful. Lysine generally increases immunocompetence, which means um, that we have a better antibody production and the body can defend itself better against various infections. So it generally impro improves the immune system. In addition, a study has shown that inflammatory messengers can be very strongly reduced by lysine and that within a few hours. So it has a direct influence on the virus and also, and we may have heard this before, it has an influence on possible herpes relapse. The COVID infection can trigger various latent uh, stresses in the body and um, lysine also lowers the, lowers the entire viral load of herpes, for example, which is why it also makes sense to take lysine if you have COVID symptoms. What I'm about to say is certainly very, very important for many people. Too much coffee inhibits lysine absorption, which means that increased coffee consumption without additional lysine supplementation can be problematic because it causes the levels to drop very sharply. Lysine is the antiviral amino acid that we should have in mind and look out for. Next, we have L-glutamine. In my studies, it was used a lot for the intestinal mucosa in the case of leaky gut, for example, because it helps with the regeneration of the mucous membranes. But it also provides energy for the immune cells. So it really is the food for the immune cells and for this reason should be also included at high doses. 
Glutamine is also a component of glutathione. We have already heard about uh, glutathione uh, in the glutathione peroxidase. Uh, it is a very powerful antioxidant in our body. Uh, it is um, made up of three amino acids, which is um, uh, glutamine, uh, cysteine, and glycine. All three should be present, of course, so that the body can produce it on its own. And that is why uh, it is very important. Um, glutamine, for example, boosts our killer cells, which means it also indirectly boosts our defense. Next, we have cysteine. Um, uh, we have the N-acetylcysteine uh, in brackets, which is used in therapy because it is more stable. I have already mentioned that it is a component of glutathione, which is very important due to its um, antioxidant effect, but it also has a very strong anti-mucus effect because it dissolves the uh, sulfide bridges and thus helps to dissolve mucus. It uh, also has an anti-inflammatory effect and what I find super interesting is that cysteine also breaks down the desulfide bridges of the virus itself. This means that the virus becomes less infectious so it also uh, directly affects the virus itself and it counteracts the virus. It not only helps to dissolve the mucus and prevent the lungs from becoming congested, congested, it also prevents problems. And of course, it can also be used at a later stage when people report shortness of breath or increased coughing or the like. Um, then uh, cysteine can also be used. Then finally, the amino acid glycine. This is the smallest amino acid that most frequently exists in our body and has many positive properties. It is the third component of glutathione and glycine can uh, very strongly counteract uh, the um, uh, cytokine storm, which means it has a strong anti-inflammatory effect and has a cell protective effect. So even at a later stage, it can further protect lung tissue, but uh, it can also protect tissue in general and also has a pain relieving effect. Uh, so it is an all-star that I can use everywhere, and that is very important. That is um, everything regarding the amino acids. Then we have other uh, food um, supplements that are important to me. Firstly, quercetin, which is a bioflavonoid. Uh, it's used in long COVID and also in COVID infections with very good results. It helps to renew vitamin C and glutathione. We have heard a lot about this now. Um, yeah, it helps to renew it, as I said. I mentioned the example of the rubbish truck. The rubbish truck is full and it has to be emptied so that vitamin C and glutathione can continue to work uh, as strong antioxidants. Um, so it has a strong anti-inflammatory effect, also a great effect on the vessels and also antiviral properties. It inhibits the replication of the virus uh, and multiplication of the virus. Then we have the omega-3 fatty acids. That is very important. We rather have omega-6 fatty acids in our diet and we actually have a bad relationship to omega-3 and omega-6, but we need them. Studies have actually shown that, um, well, the last study I found was from 2021, and it showed, for example, that a high omega-3 index was associated with milder causes of the disease and a lower mortality rate. This means that high omega-3 levels in the body have positive properties during an infection, but also later on. Because when we have a high omega-3 level, the membranes of our cells are much more accessible to nutrients. This means that the combination between omega-3 fatty acids and um, nutrient supplementation is uh, optimal because I can absorb it all better because my cell structure is softer. That's how you can visualize this. Omega-3 also promotes uh, glutathione formation in general, so the better my omega-3 level is the more glutathione I have and it also reduces pro-inflammatory cytokines that means it has an anti-inflammatory effect and at the same time protects the mucous membranes our epithelia in the 
intestines and the respiratory tract everywhere because this improved cell surface makes everything a little softer and more flexible and to visualize it better you would say it is uh, softer and not cracked uh, that's why a high omega-3 fatty acid index is definitely very beneficial in this context last but not least we have the proenzyme Q10. That is very important. I already said uh, at the beginning uh, that the silent inflammation, the continuous inflammation after an infection ultimately leads to a lack of energy because all those radicals disrupt our respiratory chain and our energy processes. And by administering the body with Q10, I can help the body in the short term. This strongly promotes cellular energy production. And if I have a Q10 Q10 deficiency. I generally have a lack of performance, both physically and mentally. This is also reported by some people with long COVID symptoms. There can be disorders of the vascular system, the immune system, and also the muscles can be affected. You will notice that those are some of the symptoms that are reported by patients and it can be definitely useful to supplement Q10 for a certain period of time. The Q10 metabolism in our body is very strongly dependent on zinc and selenium. So here again, there is a connection between the trace elements and that shows just how important it is that everything works together. And if the system is lagging behind in one area and I discover this, it is best to act right there so that the body can regenerate and support itself. I would, of course, like to say a few sentences about our product range. We have Rayo Base, Rayo Vita, Rayo Flora, and of course, Rayo Soul and Rayo Pure, which we should not forget. Um, and of course, you can very well cover the quantities that would normally be present in our body. However, it has to be said that in very extreme situations with strong infections, with strong stress, also with long COVID uh, symptoms, higher dosages are often needed. For example, it can make sense to take the supplements both in the morning and in the evening, so not just once, but several times a day. And of course, you always have to bear in mind that people who suffer from long COVID um, often already had small problems in their bodies before and COVID uh, uh, just uh, was the catalyst. This means uh, that uh, there may already have been prior malnutrition. Maybe they already lacked many nutrients, uh, they had increased stress, heavy metal exposure, uh, where, for example, Radio Pure is useful for detoxification. That means it uh, definitely makes sense to use it, but you always have to consider that something may have been present beforehand and that it can definitely make uh, sense to supplement it um, in case of acute symptoms or acute infections. I had already mentioning, uh, mentioned adding omega-3, for example, to improve the absorption. In the end, it is about a completely replenishing. If I'm down here, of course, I have to replenish a large amount to get to a normal level. And I think it's important to point out that higher dosages are definitely useful in some situations. So that brings me to the end of my little overview of the nutrients regarding long COVID. Of course, it is very, very important to check each individual's uh, status by means of uh, lab diagnostics um, to see what, for example, the zinc level is. Please pay special attention to the fact that some nutrients can only be determined in a whole blood test because they can only be found in the whole blood and not in the serum. So again, please pay close attention to the uh, lab diagnostic again. Uh, and then uh, if you know what you lack, uh, uh, you can supplement it in cooperation with a doctor or uh, someone who is well trained in this area so that it can finally recover quickly and overcome this long COVID problem. I already mentioned the second point on the slide. There are other factors I should definitely take into account when it comes to long COVID. That is our diet, our food. Even if we eat organic food, there may still be some uh, burden. And unfortunately, food has fewer nutrients than it used to have a few years ago, whether that has connected to global warming or something else. Uh, but uh, in any case, there are various studies that show that a pepper, for example, no longer has the nutrients it used to have just a few years ago. This means uh, that a healthy diet cannot always cover everything and then supplements have to be taken. 
Well, in the end, micronutrient therapy can be a very good support for patients suffering from long COVID symptoms, especially if I focus on the causes. So that means if I really look at which biochemical processes are lacking, where can I quickly help the body to regain its self-regulation and reduce inflammation. I wish all those who suffer from this problem a speedy recovery and thank you for the opportunity to be here today on a different uh, mission and uh, leaving my comfort zone of the veterinary field for a while. And I now hand back to Mrs. Bunkenburg and Mr. Heimes. Thank you so much. That was so interesting for us. And I'm sure that everybody now is thinking in another way about nutrition, about minerals, vitamins, and hopefully it's helpful for all our long COVID patients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it was really very interesting yeah, um, to, to have all this information regarding the, uh, the nutrition um, and what is possible uh, to, to do, uh, because this is also a, a very easy way of... Uh, of helping uh, when you have um, uh, long COVID. But I want to come back to um, the programs uh, we are using uh, regarding long COVID, uh, Ms. Bungenburg. Yes, we told you that we also want to support you with using bioresonance according to Paul Schmidt. You know that is our aim to support many people with our frequencies. And you know we are very successful when we talk about uh, bacterial virus giving energy detoxification. And therefore our recommendation for the program you can see here on this slide. We are starting normal with analyzed preparation, vitalization, acupuncture, that is for energy. And then we really give you the recommendation also to integrate enzyme Q10. Enzyme Q10, I think most people of you know, is very strong related to ATP, also to energy. What we can do is that the, um, we cannot give you the enzyme directly, but then it's easier for you to take this enzyme from nutrition or also to produce it in the organism. Next thing is enzyme cytochrome P450, that is for detoxification, very, very helpful. L-serine is an amino acid you need because um, when you have trouble with virus, the virus need L-serine, then you have no L-serine and you need for producing other amino acids. Mm -hmm. Then we have 2020.10 uh, double-stranded DNA viruses. Inside of this uh, thing, I will tell you later what kind of virus are in this program. Interesting. Coronavirus, we give you ATP complete. Scar interference, you know, we have uh, at the bronchies, for example, scars after COVID. That is a very, very strong problem. Acute local inflammation, we are not talking only from the upper respiratory system. You can have this acute inflammation everywhere in the body. We are talking of lymphocytes because of the immune system, but we are also raising the defense capacity with our programs. And then we integrated the heart, the respiratory system, also the kidneys, very interesting, but the nervous system, nervous system is very special and really strong problems from this virus are in the nervous system. Psyche, stress reduction, and then the basic detoxification. As you can see, it's a little bit longer than we <laughs> normally recommend programs, but our recommendation is to do that in the night, meanwhile you're sleeping. Mm -hmm. In case that you have the problems in another physiology, what is possible, then please integrate in this program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it is really true. Uh, our recommendation um, regarding uh, long COVID harmonization is a little bit longer than uh, in a normal way. And therefore, it takes a little bit more time. And uh, all the RAH numbers you can uh, see here on the chart are, of course, um, uh, frequency uh, uh, programs. It means this is a combination of different uh, uh, frequencies uh, uh, summarized in this RH program. And when you are in uh, this uh, RH program, then in the Polar uh, 40 or in the Ryocom PS10, you can harmonize with the related frequency spectra uh, your body. And um, 
uh, we said already that uh, our recommendation for long COVID uh, harmonization is a little bit longer. And therefore, of course, it is um, a fantastic idea to work here in this way uh, with, uh, for example, a Railcom PS10 Basic. Yeah? A Railcom PS10 Basic with a green card. Meanwhile, not only here in Germany, totally successful, it is also an international Uh, usage we have here regarding the polar analyzing energetic programs uh, giving this to the green card and using it on the on the basic then uh, especially at home um, many 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 uh, naturopaths and uh, medical doctors are using the ps10 basic uh, then for home therapy and this is of course totally comfortable uh, for the patients because they have not to visit permanently um, the, the clinics. Yeah? And um, that means uh, we have really a very clear recommendation. Um, I'm using um, this in, uh, for, for, for myself and for, for my family uh, in the same way. PS10 on the bedside table, then the green card with a program on it and you can sleep then uh, uh, very nicely um, directly on the, on the detector. Yeah, um, you know, uh, where are the, the big advantages? Of course, um, when you when you treat yourself when you sleep, <laughs> you are not, uh, I will say, wasting your time. It is a big advantage uh, to sleep and to treat at the same time. Yeah, and of course, when you have the PS10 uh, basic with this green card at home, uh, you can treat all your family members uh, at the same not at the same time, but with the device, uh, so that um, everybody. Uh, in your family can participate the usage uh, of the Riocom PS10 with a long COVID uh, program. Yeah, this is uh, our uh, clear um, uh, recommendation uh, how to use. Of course, you can you can use uh, uh, the the Riocom PS1000 Polar for zero with the green card or the program directly in your clinic. Uh, that's that's clear. But um, for especially we have. We heard it already, we have hundreds of thousands of patients and therefore it can be very helpful uh, to use this system at home also. Yeah, we have a, a very special wording also we want to explain uh, regarding uh, long COVID. Yes, and uh, when we are talking about pacing, um, then we are talking a little bit um, that about the fact that you have to change a little bit your behavior. Um, we gave you information with our experts about how to cure or how to support long COVID infections. We give you information about minerals and vital substances, how to support all these things. Then you get the treatment program and the recommendation for the night harmonization. But that is not enough. You have really to come down and a little bit to think about what you are doing and which way you are, for example, going to the office or you doing your sports or something else. And you have really to stop, think about it, and you have to think about a clever energy management because you have a lot of problems inside of your body and it's not possible still to continue in the same way like before. Therefore, it makes a lot of sense to come down, to reduce, for example, uh, your sport or what are you doing, very stressful things to reduce because otherwise you're pushing the symptoms and it's not good for you. Therefore, a clever energy management is very, very important in this situation. Uh, yeah, I think energy management is uh, definitely a very important uh, word uh, regarding uh, long COVID, uh, of course. And uh, we here at uh, the Ryanex Biomedical thought about how we can help Uh, long COVID uh, patients from the view of bioresonance according to Paul Schmidt in the best way. And uh, you know that um, uh, we already developed um, the classic mini Ryonex uh, with um, his um, with this uh, influence, for example, to the selectivity, to energy uh, from our point of view and uh, with very nice uh, studies about that. Um, and uh, we created on, on, the, um, on this 
basic device. It means on the, the Mini Ryan X, then the 5G Mini Ryan X. And uh, because uh, long COVID is such a worldwide problem, um, we thought about how we can help these uh, people in the most easiest way. And therefore, um, we uh, decided to create then um, around this Mini Ryan X family a new one. And this is then, and I think this is a big surprise uh, for you also, we created then the Mini Ryan X LC. We heard uh, in this uh, webinar a lot about uh, things you can do with RH programs and whatever, and we found a possibility to integrate uh, 10 of the most important RH programs in um, the Mini Ryan X LC. And I can show this device uh, to you. This is really brand new, yes. And I can show this um, here. Uh, the shape is, of course, the shape of the Mini Ryan X or Mini Ryan X 5G. Um, we have a new label on it. Um, and inside we have a changing, it means the The, the classic and the fundamental frequency of 12.5 and 10 is integrated, but also 10 of the most important, I said it already, RAH programs um, regarding LC. Yeah, and um, I think it is of great interest to analyze a little bit the, the RAH programs which we integrated. And Ms. Bungenburg, this is the list of the RAH programs um, which we integrated in the new Mini Ryan X LC. Yes, uh, it was not so easy to decide which one we take in or not because we have not so much space. Mm. Uh, therefore, we have really to take care and we ask the experts and therefore it was really an interesting group to decide and also to talk about uh, their experiences. And at the end, we decided that we integrate Enzyme Q10, for example, because I told you before, it's very strong related to ATP production, and that is energy, and you need this energy. Then we talk about Enzyme uh, Cytochrome P450, and this enzyme is related to detoxification. It's related to detox, um, for example, toxins from outside, We have a lot of problems in our bodies. And as you know, a good detoxification is so important for a healthy situation. Therefore, we decided to integrate it. We have the amino acid L-serine because L-serine is needed. Um, you need it when you have a problem with virus. The virus take L-serine, but L-serine you need for producing other amino acids. Therefore, you really have to take care that you have it. Then we have uh, 22... Point 10, double strain DNA, virus complete. That is a very big program and very important viruses inside. I will later tell you more. We have also the coronavirus. We have ATP complete because of energy, a basic detoxification also to support detox. We have acute local inflammation. We have the lymphocytes and we have the nervous system. Um, the nervous system is very strong related to the viruses. And I want to give you now a little bit more information about the big spectrum of 2020.10. Because we found out that more and more studies are showing that herpes virus, the family of the herpes virus, um, seems to be that they will be triggered or that you all a little bit an explanation. You all have this virus inside of your body, but in case that you're good balanced, then they are sleeping and you have no trouble. <laughs> but after corona infection, it seems to be that corona is really waking up this kind of virus and then they start doing wrong things. That means that you get the same symptoms like before. As you know, Epstein-Barr virus or also herpes zoster, all of these virus will be reactivated. The nervous system is really affected from this kind of virus with lots of symptoms. And for example, sleep disorders or you have concentration problems and lots of problems we found out are related to the combination of the virus and the nervous system. Therefore, our recommendation, I can really give you information if you need. A lot of uh, studies are working with this information now. Therefore, our recommendation is that you directly balance also the herpes virus spectra. Therefore, we integrate in the LC. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really, that's really, I think, a fantastic idea. Yeah, um, and I think uh, this can be very, very helpful because what are your your chances? What are your possibilities at the moment? And I think with the Mini Ryanx LC, we can give from the view of by resonance, according to Paul Schmidt, um, the an energetic answer <laughs> to this. Yeah, and you know that each RH program is an energetic program uh, regarding uh, the principles of bioresonance according to Paul Schmidt, and we want to harmonize and to help the body um, with this inf with this uh, frequency spectrus, yeah, to come back easier uh, to help and to to balance uh, all this. These uh, symptoms, which are related with with long COVID, yeah, this is our idea. Um, we hope that uh, all the information you got uh, in this uh, webinar uh, from uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Poichel, from um, uh, Mrs. Alberts, uh, but also uh, directly from us, um, are helpful um, in covering a little bit these uh, symptoms of uh, long COVID and uh, that the, the new Mini Rhinox LC will help also as a portable device um, to, to harmonize uh, these uh, influences also. Yeah, from our point of view, thank you so much for investing your time uh, for this webinar. It was one of the longest um, we had um, in the, we had already yes i think this is really a long one um, but again thank you so much and please take care of you bye 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 bye